Uh, now for part four, the get to for one. And get to for one is the idea of, uh, let's say, I like to say maybe someone studied ESL for a while and they're kind of getting tired of it after a couple years or a year. So they want to study a subject. They want to study their major. They want to study business or engineering. And that's pretty close to this idea of uh, the content-oriented language teaching where students are just studying science, history, and, and language is the medium of instruction. So they're learning, they're learning language along the way, but, but, you know, in what they perceive as, you know, a more interesting way. I mean, not that it's not interesting just to study language, because even when you take a language class, I mean, you are talking about things. You're talking about, you know, like um, going to Mars, or you're talking about global warming, or mm, uh, how to find a job in the modern world. So there, there's topics for sure, but uh, but the the content oriented language teachings referred a lot here to as like an immersion type of program especially popular in in other countries uh, in other countries Europe I'm not countries but areas in, you know in Asia and Africa where where uh, it's popular to have basically English speaking schools that kids can go to so that they can you know learn this this world language and be prepared for international study and things and <clears throat> so it's very popular in other countries to put students in basically English speaking K through 12s as popular with parents. The U.S., um, we, we have, uh, right now we don't have a lot of bilingual education. It's kind of come and gone. Uh, uh, in English, the schools, the public schools try to have their classes in English. But if there's a big immigrant community that speaks another language, Sometimes school districts have fought for offering instruction in you know both English and the language of, of that population, just so mainly it's so they don't fall behind, so that they um, who knows it could be partly so they can kind of keep their their first language too, and keep that connection with their first language. But mainly it's just to kind of help them uh, learn a lot of content. And, so, and not fall behind, you know, as like an ESL student, kind of feel like they're falling behind in the content areas. But uh, they talked about in Canada as well, where you've got English-speaking kids that they want to learn French, uh, because Canada is bilingual. So sometimes it's popular to, since the 60s, to put these English-speaking kids like in French immersion schools, so that they will learn, so that they'll be very strong with French, and then, and then, um, learn English as well. And <clears throat> I've even heard of recently uh, international universities uh, will offer a lot of courses in English and it's for their stu their country's students and then uh, sometimes it's also to attract international students from different countries who can then come into that university. And <clears throat> Uh, but a lot of, pro you know, there's still problems with uh, the example of the Canadian French immersion program. That it was still very teacher-centered and kind of structure-focused. And the students were just giving, you know, real short, little blunt answers to things. So it wasn't necessarily a real communicative type, type program in that case. Uh, they mentioned Hong Kong, where you've got English and Chinese and students wanting to learn both of those. And, but the problem there was a lot of the uh, teachers were strong in Chinese, but they weren't real strong in English. So when they would teach the English classes, they'd have a lot of limits to their ability to use English, which that's like a big EFL, pro EFL problem anyway, where you have uh, English teachers around the world who uh, have a lot of trouble just producing English themselves. And, but they still have to teach it because as as, there's such a demand, you know, for, for English instruction. So they mentioned in Hong Kong, the teachers would speak Chinese and mix. So it would be the mix of Chinese and English. And, and uh, they tried all kinds of ways. The students also weren't really ready for the English, so they really had to simplify the English classes so much that they weren't really as effective uh, it's another thing that just reminds me of in the U.S., 
sometimes uh, in high school, uh, a student from uh, another language background, they'll take a foreign language class in high school or college and get like an easy A. So you'll have like a Chinese American who can take, who learn Chinese at home, so they can take a Chinese class in college and just like ace it, or um, or Mexican American or uh, you know German American, whatever uh, language that student knows. So people do that. That's a way of. That's also a way of actually studying your your parents' language a little more, kind of studying your first language, kind of keeping keeping up. Usually in the U.S. we think of uh, immigrant children going to like Saturday school to keep up with you know Korean or to keep up with their family's language and and in some ways their their first language as well. But the Saturday school is a way to kind of keep studying Japanese or Chinese or Korean. That's popular as well. But basically, you know, when you study content in English, you know, it's challenging, cognitively challenging, it's interesting, and it's practical too. Sometimes they're learning an actual skill that they can use, uh, and uh, so it has a practical side to it as well. And instead of just studying language, they're actually studying something, and, and, and they, they feel that they're learning something that way. Well, that's a great way. And even um, uh, some teacher training courses are that way, where students will come from other countries, and they'll study like this course in order to learn uh, pedagogy and how to teach English, but they're actually improving their English a lot, too, because this is a content course for them as well.